You're listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. With me today are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We each have about 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Every week, we take the five biggest stories on our websites and discuss the impacts they might have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also do us a big favor by leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Anna, how are you doing this week? Good. How are you guys doing? I'm pumped up. Pumped up. We got a visitor from Jersey. He's in the back. I'm excited. How are you doing, Jeff? Awesome, man. Good, Good. to be here. Yeah, right on. <clears throat> All right, let's get started. Top story this week. It's not the top. It's just the first. I got to get that sometime. Got to get that sometime. <laughs> the highest paid CEOs by state. The Associated Press and data firm Equilar recently announced the top paid CEOs by state for 2020. The survey only looked at publicly traded companies with more than $1 billion in revenue. So some states were just left out. The median pay was $12.7 million last year, a combination of salary, bonus, stock, and other perks. Highest was Alexander Karp of Palantir Technologies in Colorado. He made $1.1 billion last year for the company that specializes in software used in sensitive data environments, everything from intelligence and defense to automotive and aerospace. Lowest was Lyndon R. Evans, who only made $4.1 million at Black Hills, a utility company in South Dakota. It is a bummer. Jeff, you got a feel for Lyndon here. <laughs> I don't feel for any of them. Um, I think they're in pretty good shape. But I mean, I think they're also, I have no problems with any of these folks getting paid what they're getting paid. The guy from um, Palantir kind of wrecked the curve there a little bit. I mean, man, a time. billion dollar salary? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's um, that's just crazy to fathom. How do you, if that's me, I think I work for one year and I'm done. Yeah, one right. and done. The, uh, you know, it did note that sometimes uh, different perks pay out at different times, which right. sort of wrecks the curve. But that's still a banger of a year. Yeah, that's not bad. And the one thing that kind of caught me, though, is we didn't see a lot of traditional manufacturers on here. A lot mm -hmm. of these technology and software companies obviously have inroads into manufacturing in the industrial sector. But, um, you know, no Fords, no GMs, no John Deere's, uh, folks like that. Yeah. So, And I know it's it's a little convoluted when you start getting into figuring out what somebody's pay package is, and there can be a lot of different things that value out different. I know this; these guys try to bring all of that into the mix and figuring out their annual compensation. But, um, yeah, I mean, there was no, no Tesla on here either. You know? California, though, he's competing. Against, it's by state, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So every, you know, how many tech CEOs oh, in no, California? Oh, no, he just personally moved to Texas. He's not in The company's still in California. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I noticed that there was some automotive, a lot of software, but there were staples like GE and J&J. &J. Uh, the average hourly pay for a manufacturing worker, I had to look that up, with more than 20 years of experience is just 19 dollars and 34 cents according to payscale.com it works out to about thirty eight thousand dollars a year Mas machinists average forty five thousand six hundred dollars a year according to the u.s bureau of statistics and a little better for mechanical engineers averaging about 93 and electrical engineers making around one hundred and three thousand <clears throat> hundred and three hundred thousand dollars each year a great salary but still you know four million off the lowest paid ceo you know <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was worth mentioning. You mentioned Johnson & Johnson. Mm -hmm. So their CEO, I remembered reading about this um, in this past spring, but he ran into some investor pushback on his pay package. I don't know if you guys saw that. but um, So he made the list, obviously, for top pay in New Jersey. It was like $23 million pay package. Um, but what isn't mentioned is that his latest pay package was he was targeted by what was called like a vote no campaign mm. that was organized by incidentally the state of Illinois Treasury office Interesting. Um, and they were urging investors to reject his pay package which Reuters actually valued at about 30 million for 2020. Oh okay um, and the reason they said was because it didn't take into account uh, the like billions in company write downs related to J and J's role in the opioid crisis and also um, the many lawsuits that were related to the um, baby powder oh yeah that, that yeah. J and J yeah so um, I guess that was not calculated into because you know a lot of these are are tabulated based on like a company's profitability targets and stuff so you know if <laughs> profits yeah. minus losses I thought 
<laughs> yeah. So you took so you um, took a seven million dollar cut. Well, that I don't I don't know if these two are apples to apples like if these oh, are gotcha. the same year that they're discussing okay um in 2024 2020 i don't know um all i know is that like so the campaign was ultimately not successful mm. but you know experts are saying that it sends a message whether it's successful or not which sort of says to j and j like you need to talk about this um you know just because the economy is good maybe we're going to see more of this um uh investor pushback like we saw with the Exxon deal like mm -hmm. just because the economy is good doesn't mean that these companies can like push the stuff through and no one's going to say anything uh so i thought that was interesting um you know when we talk about these sort of extravagant pay packages especially public companies that who knows like what what kind of uh pushback we might see in the future more of, of this i don't know yeah no it's important to stress that these are all just public companies so i mean who knows what everyone's making in the private sector the one that caught my eye too was Norwegian Cruise Lines. Did you oh, see that? Yeah. Uh -huh. The CEO made like thirty one point nine million. Like mm -hmm. who took a cruise in twenty twenty? <clears throat> well that's that's what I was gonna kinda pose. Like, is he worth it because he kept the company together during a time when there was no business? Or was he working like <laughs> three hours a day yeah. and just sort of checking his email and oh, right. check, yeah. you know? he's the last guy there <laughs> he's just hanging out watching the boats one day we'll get these yeah. back out there well same with J&J &J, though like the you know obviously they had a big year with the vaccine and stuff but you know the Supreme Court we saw this week just to decline to take up that talc case to overturn a verdict which was like two billion dollars that um, this uh, plaintiffs had had won this money because they had proven that they got ovarian cancer mm -hmm. so that's probably a watershed. Like, there's going to be a lot more of these lawsuits. I can see why investors are like, uh, whoa, hold on. Like, we have to slow down a little bit here. No, uh, that, I mean, that makes sense. It's uh, It'll be interesting to see if that actually happens. Correct. <laughs> um, our fourth most popular story this week, uh, Sri Lanka braces for environmental disaster as the ship sinks. Two weeks ago, the ship was on fire. Last week, after burning for 12 days, the MV Express Pearl started sinking off the coast of Sri Lanka, and local authorities fear that it could become an environmental disaster. Debris and wreckage are already washing ashore, and locals are being warned not to touch it because they don't know what kind of caustic chemicals are on it. They tried to tow the ship out to sea, but it's stuck on the seabed. While company officials claim that the 25 tons of nitric acid and other chemicals burned up in the blaze, the ship's fuel tanks still have about 300 tons of oil that can now leak into the sea and cause an environmental disaster. Jeff, I feel like it's really wishful thinking that they're like, well, maybe it all burned up. <laughs> I will, um, I'll let Anna get into the environmental side of this. Uh, just looking purely at the economics here. Mm -hmm. First of all, Again, we, when we said this last week, this story is so far from over. It mm -hmm. does not matter what ends up happening in the immediate future. There is so much more to look at here. This ship just started sailing in February. It's four months old. Yeah. I mean, and to blame the total demise of the ship and everything on it on one leaking container, um, I don't see that. I mean, there's more to understand there in terms of what caused this carnage to begin with. There's also, I think, worth investigating why it was let into this port in the first place after being turned away by two others. Um, and then you just look at the pure economics. When you look at Sri Lanka's economy, three of their biggest industries are shipping, mm -hmm. tourism, and fishing. Well, fishing is definitely going to take a big hit. That's a $90 million industry for Sri Lanka. Wow. Okay. Shipping is one of their biggest um, top 10 industries. That's also going to come under, you would think, a lot more scrutiny here from maritime regulators when they look at why this was even let in to begin with and what else may be going on there. And then you also look at tourism because all this garbage is washing up on these shores of these beaches where you would think they may be looking for some business right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you look at this company, and this one really blew me away. I was looking at a, a release that, uh, that Newswire put out, and they had an interview with Express Feeder CEO. This company is based out of Singapore. Their CEO's name is, and I hope I'm saying it correctly, Shmuel Yaskovitz. And they were asking him a lot of different questions about what do you think happened, what's going on. And all through the interview, he's being, he's saying the right thing, saying, horrible tragedy. We need to figure out what happened. We're really not sure right now. But then they asked him about the potential economic um, issues that could surprise, that could happen or that could come to be realized by his company. And his response is, we're insured 
the direct financial burden on express feeders will be very limited. Hmm. Now, when you look at the actual cargo, probably it's worth somewhere in the neighborhood of five to $10 million. So I believe that, yes, <laughs> they yeah. will be covered by insurance there. But when you look at what Sri Lanka is looking for in terms of uh, remedia- uh, remediation on, on the environmental elements, this company is going to be facing some pretty severe financial issues mm-hmm. right yeah. now when all this comes out, because there's going to be a lot more investigation, a lot more things that come out of this. So, yeah, this story, again, we're not even in the middle of it yet, I don't think. Well, and we just saw news about the fishing industry being frozen and terrified as to what's going on because, Anna, it is an environmental disaster. I can't imagine there's going to be a huge demand for toxic fish. Yeah. I mean, and if you look at the list of goods that were carried on the ship, because they did release that, um, the cargo is just like you could not come up with a fictional list that would be like a grosser, yeah. <laughs> awful dump into the ocean. And I also find it strange that we're viewing like burning up caustic chemicals as like a, a possible win here. Yeah. Because last yeah, I they're checked, they're just in the sky now. They're just they just float away and then nothing happens because we can't see them anymore. Yeah. Uh, that's awful. I mean, like you know, uh, last I checked, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. Uh, we have a huge emission problem. I mean, this is terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you know, Jeff raised a lot of really good points about the impact, not just on the environment, but to the people of Sri Lanka, whose economy depends on some of these key industries. Um, I thought the CEO's comments came off as sort of insensitive and a little flippant. I know he was discussing the impact directly on his company. However, uh, it just makes you wonder, like, if business decisions are being made based on the fact that like our liabilities are X and we don't see anything beyond that. And and I think you're right, Jeff. I mean, if you look at what happened with the Suez Canal situation and how Egypt is going after this company. For what, 900 million? They lowered they it at this it, point yeah. to like, it's like 600, but I don't think that they have settled on anything yet. Mm-hmm. And they're factoring in things like lost tourism or lost you know, sh- shipping and of goods and that's all. That's just that's just purely an economical situation. Mm-hmm. There is no environmental fixes that are going to need to be exactly. coming to place. They're like, mm-hmm. there's obviously going to be here. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And then you wonder what what is the price tag you put on that um, in these industries that have been decimated right on the back of a pandemic when people are not traveling in Sri Lanka, as you said, is known for its beaches. This is a big, big problem. Well, and what are the big, what's the biggest problem with uh, what's in the water right now? It's microplastics. Right. Mm-hmm. And so three billion tiny plastic pellets, also nurdle, known as nurdles that are used to make plastic bags, uh, were dumped into the sea, have already begun washing ashore. And did you see the photo, Jeff, of, you know, they said, stay away, don't touch it. Yeah. And there's just people with bags out there looking for treasures. Yeah. What do, I mean, what do you what do you say to that other than stop if it's well, <laughs> right. But if, if it's also if people are out there trying to preserve their livelihoods, yeah. exactly. um, you can't completely fault them for that. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, the fact that that he, he could have that response burning acid, mm-hmm. that's that's toxic. That, mm-hmm. So it kills people. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't just be that that flippant about it. And I understand there's legal elements to his responses that need to be factored in doesn't want to take responsibility for something that could lead to something more down the road. But again, this company, Express Feeders, they're facing some long court battles, in my opinion. Yeah. And you know what? If, from my perception here, too, like just seeing these are the types of incidents that they encourage individuals to say things like our actions don't matter mm-hmm. um, because oh, yeah. the bulk, of, you know, look, why save a plastic bag when three billion nurdles went into the sea, like, you know, <laughs> on a regular day? Yeah. But but I think that's true. People say, like, ah, it's, it's the problem of industrial companies. Industry. It's yeah. industry. It needs to be regulated. Me as an individual, I can't do anything. I can't make an impact. And so people kind of tune out on what their individual responsibilities are, I believe, mm-hmm. because of stuff like this. No, I think there's some something to that where why invest in solar panels like we've talked about so much in the last few weeks when, you know, they're torching caustic chemicals out in the sea. Mm-hmm. Uh, but still do that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, still do your part. <laughs> still do your part. It still works. Uh, take a shovel to Sri Lanka and uh, start bagging up nurdles. 
All right, our third most popular story this week. Ford is cutting F-150, Mustang, and Bronco production. Ford recently announced plans to temporarily close eight factories in June. Some closures will last into July. The closures stem from the global semiconductor chip shortage, and it means production cuts for three iconic vehicles, particularly the F-150, the Bronco Sport SUV, and the Mustang. The closures are everywhere, from Chicago, Flat Rock and Dearborn, Michigan, Kansas City, Missouri, Louisville, Kentucky, Ohio, Canada, Mexico. Production losses stemming from the chip shortage will cost the automaker at least $2.5 billion in 2021 and idle thousands of jobs. Anna, I feel like the chip shortage continues to make a significant impact on the automotive industry. It does. And we've been talking about this for how long? I mean, months, really. Mm -hmm. But um, and it, I think this story kind of brought home the reality of like the impact. We talked about Jeep recently. They cut um, that entire yeah, yeah. sixteen hundred layoffs at a Jeep plant because Stellantis is, you know, they can't get these cars built because they don't have the parts. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought this was interesting because I saw earlier this week, and you guys probably saw this too, um, that GM actually said that the efforts that they'd implemented to address the shortage of microchips were working better than they'd expected, mm -hmm. and that the chip shortage was turning out to be not as bad as <laughs> they thought. <laughs> yeah, they only thought it was gonna cost them five, or they thought it was gonna cost them five billion, and it's only two and a half. But you know what, they, they're they actually revising their forecast oh, okay. for the year to reflect an improvement in outlook, which oh. I guess I'm curious if you guys have thoughts on this, because I just read this like last week that the average price of a used car is um, up, it's up by like $4,000. Yeah, like it's up 30 to 40%. Yeah, so yeah. the implication obviously is like there's such a shortage of new cars, the the used car market is booming. I mean, there's a lot of really significant stuff going on here. Like what does GM know that we don't know? I guess what are they doing here that's different from what everyone else is doing? Because the Ford F-150 is, I mean, that's not just Ford's best-selling vehicle. That is the best-selling vehicle in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that they're just like out of an abundance of caution slowing down here. Like they are doing this because they absolutely have to, right? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I just thought it was a weird sort of uh, dichotomy between the two automakers that are head-to-head -head competitors why GM is saying, eh, it's not that big of a deal. It didn't, uh, it didn't hit electrics, though. So maybe they'll just pick up all the slack with F-150 Lightnings. I'm sure. You think I'm sure so? people will just just slide into those and without even blinking. Yeah. Yeah, just jump on board uh, the new lightning truck. You gonna get one? <laughs> they're not done yet, though, are they? I mean, I don't think they're. Ready they're yet. starting to be made. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things you can look at maybe just volume that GM can do that because when you do look at the F-150, the pure volume, the number of vehicles they're putting out there. So GM's forecast may look good, but the total number of vehicles moving may still be significantly less than what Ford is dealing with. Because mm -hmm. when you do look at these vehicles, that they are. Um, they're looking to halt or stall production on. As you mentioned, the F-150, it's the number one selling vehicle in the U.S. for, what, 40 years? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always been number one for whatever. The Mustang is actually the number one U.S. sports vehicle that's being sold right now. Like twice as many uh, Mustangs as Camaros were sold last year. Mm -hmm. So if you want to look at that comparison. And then the Bronco, another huge launch for Ford. And they're forecasting like 200,000 of those being sold, which would put them in the top 10 in terms of SUV sales. So... That's what really gets the attention here is because they are big name brands that they're halting production on. To me, maybe it feels like Ford is has a little bit more force, foresight for Ford. Um, looking at the situation more realistically and understanding what they need to do to be able to at least get some of these vehicles out the door to preserve some of that volume for mm -hmm. customers, uh, being a little more proactive. Um, it could also just be because there is such a high volume of these particular vehicles that they need to put out uh, in a given time. Uh, the one thing I wanted to note is that uh, they didn't re release any numbers in the terms of employees that are going to be idled. But if you just take those plants that they named in the release, uh, it's going to be more than 32,000 jobs that are going to be idled through June and into July. And wow. that's a lot of people not working. Wow. That the is. fortunate thing is there are, in some of those cases, it's a week, week and a half yeah. type of thing, which still doesn't make it easy, obviously. But again, I think that does show some good planning on Ford's part in terms of staggering these things out a little bit so it's not a mass layoff type situation like what we talked about with Jeep last week. Right. Two yeah. The, um, on a good note, that uh, Renasis uh, plant in oh. Japan that caught fire that was a major chip supplier to the automotive industry, they are actually 
saying they're back online now faster than they had actually thought that they would be. Yeah, so no, that would be a boon. It's not going to solve the problem. It was actually just more like a kick in the teeth, like in the middle of the problem. Yeah, the, <laughs> it will help, but yeah, the largest chip maker. Uh, yeah, they're running at like eighty-eight percent now, mm-hmm. and it was at following an earthquake, right? That shut them down. That was a different or a fire plant. This okay. was a fire. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the second most popular story this week: uh, U.S. soldiers accidentally invade a factory. It was an accident. On May 11th, a group of U.S. soldiers were on a NATO training exercise in Bulgaria when a mistake sent them off course. The group was supposed to clear and secure multiple structures of the U- on the U.S. airbase, but they somehow strayed onto the private property next door. The soldiers stormed an operating sunflower oil factory with weapons drawn, seizing and clearing the premises, including the workers. No firearms were discharged, but the factory's owner and Bulgarian president are pretty unhappy, and the owner is suing. Anna, I would be unhappy too. That is a a hell of a disruption to the workday. Yeah, it really is. Like, um, you know, as you said, the factory's owner has already filed a lawsuit. Um, And like the first thing I did when I read this headline was sort of like laugh at the absurdity of it. Mm -hmm. But then I was thinking like, this had to be so traumatizing for these people yeah. that are just at work and they have no clue what's going on. And then suddenly, I mean, did you see the the, the footage? footage? Yeah. Like, I mean, guns drawn, like serious weapons. They have no clue what's going on. They no, probably think they're, they're just, being held hostage. Just making oil. Yeah. So f- I can see why the factory owner is, is fuming. Like from a business standpoint, as you mes- mentioned, very disruptive. Like. It means downtime. It means probably sick time, mental health days for these workers. Just disruption in general stemming from an incident that probably left these workers feeling like absolutely terrorized. So uh, he he mentioned that he he was, quote, offended and humiliated this owner. And mm-hmm. if you look at the surveillance footage, like that's clear. But yeah. I don't know. You have you have a military background. Like who is at fault here? They said no one has been disciplined. And I also I kind of feel like it is hard to point fingers at these soldiers that are doing this training exercise because if they were not told where to be then how do they know but like i'm sure you have an opinion (laughs) (laughs) this comes a week after i was making fun of the navy so there must be some karma at work here (laughs) Uh, yeah i mean the one thing i would say this is definitely not a live fire exercise so Mm -hmm. they were not going in with any live ammunition didn't have to shoot at all what's weird is this was close to the air base. Yeah. So they had to have some sort of recognition of this facility. Like some leadership had to know like this plant is there. Yeah. So what this what this what this feels like is you had somebody new in the field um, who just got you know uh, disoriented or, or something. Yeah. I mean, this is straight out of stripes. I don't I don't really know <laughs> what to say here. I mean, other than this unit is has an amazing history to it. I mean, mm-hmm. this is this the 173rd Airborne was formed during World War One. I. I mean, the unit's over 100 years old. So they've got a little experience. They've got a little legacy to them. Um, they're good in the air. You know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe their ground game needs a little work. <laughs> I noticed. I did notice in the footage. I didn't see. I didn't see any workers in the footage. And I wonder if that was very. Ca- they were very selective as to what. Uh, uh, what they released. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Um, it doesn't say how big the factory is, too. I mean, I don't know how big the workforce is. Not that that matters. but uh, No, but I mean, it was a fairly... I mean, there was at least two different angles, and it was a, f- a fair size shop. Yeah. Know? I mean, could you just imagine you're working at you're working at your machine all day, and all of a sudden they storm the back door uh, or breach the back door? The U.S. military did apologize for the disastrous t- training accident and says it will investigate the cause. So they'll I mean, find the guy who is... The only thing I can think of, because some of the training we would do would be in parks, okay? Yeah. So when you see a bunch of guys, even though we had no ammo, no ability to do any type of real damage, mm-hmm. like when you see a bunch of guys walking around camoed up where, mm-hmm. you know, with machine, with, with get rifles, um, it can freak you out. So we always had to tell, like, park rangers mm-hmm. and stuff we were going to be there doing this yeah. stuff so they could give people a heads up. Yeah. I don't know. Shouldn't somebody, facility... I think somebody forgot to make a phone call yeah. here and say, hey, can we do this? And they're probably like, that sounds awesome. Yeah, our people would totally be on board. And then there was nothing after that. Well, I mean, that's the only thing I could think of. Even if they, I mean, they said it was next door. So even if it was next door, you think they they would have gotten a head up, heads up like, well, hey, just so you know, 
if you're on break looking on the other side, uh, we're going to have weapons drawn. It might be a little start. This, this unit is based out of Italy mm -hmm. and they're airborne. So they may have dropped in here. This may not have been their home base. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there may be still somebody went ahead mm -hmm. to, to know that they're, this is where they're going to be. It, the, like I said, the only thing I can think of, two people worked this out and they forgot to tell the third guy who would have been <laughs> the one in charge of letting everybody else know. I don't yeah. know. It's it's so crazy. I liked the statement from the embassy that said, quote, we always learn from these exercises. I hope so. Yeah. I hope so. This one. Okay. Yeah. That's what I tell my kids. The only bad mistake is when you don't learn from. Right. You know? Well, tell those soldiers. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I'll put you in charge. Hey, you'll be yeah. saying those in a couple of years, too. I already tell him I'm so disappointed in his choices, even though he has no idea what that means. <laughs> Makes me feel better, though. Uh, right. Our top story this week. A rogue drone hunted a human. According to a report from New Scientist, there is evidence that a weaponized drone went on a rogue mission last year and it hunted a human target. A UN report suggests a quadcopter being used in fully autonomous mode in Libya autonomously pursued a soldier that was trying to retreat. The drone was likely the first to embody the, quote, killer robot characterization pursuing an object without being instructed to. It is unknown at this time if the incident resulted in any casualties. New Scientist says the event suggests that international efforts to ban lethal autonomous weapons before they are used might already be too late. Yeah, Anna, I think they're too late. Yeah, I mean, today's dystopia nightmare story is it here. And it's not courtesy of David, for once. Yeah. Um, so that's nice. <laughs> I can only rail on it. Um <laughs> No, it's uh, it seems like uh, a terrifying spin on what should be promising technology. Yeah, I know it really was, and I, like it's weird that I almost felt a small amount of relief that this happened last year in March. Mm -hmm. So uh, some time has passed, and I don't think it's happened again. <laughs> we don't know. I don't think. Yeah, we um, don't know. So I don't know if I'll take the light side of this one. I think. Um, in positive news, mm -hmm. there's a new um, AI czar that's been mm -hmm. um, assigned by the White House. This is kind of the first of its kind. Um, her name's Lynn Parker, and she's a computer scientist and pioneering roboticist. Anyway, her job is now to get the U.S. government working together with business, research, international allies, and and kind of um, get a handle on what's being done with AI. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's good because our strategy before was kind of, nah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, um, you know, I read we'll one. trust it. Exactly. Like, yeah. like I read, like, one expert characterized this as, like, a step forward in, in the right direction to sort of, like, nurture this tech for the good of humanity and not just um, this is a race that needs to be won by the U.S., which was sort of our, our vantage before. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully, uh, you know, there's an adult here that's going <laughs> to yeah. help and try to, um, you know, this obviously took place in Libya. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that need to get on board and partner together to make sure that this kind of AI doesn't get out of control. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of key stakeholders in the business community and the research community who are in support of reining this in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the scary part, as new scientists brought up in, uh, in their report, was maybe it's too late. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we're too late with a lot of things. Um, yeah. There's a lot of really scary tech out there that we're too late on, and we have to work on trying to rein it back in, create some guidelines, and hopefully this will help with that. Well, it's simple, right? Because AI can't make mistakes. There's no human error in right. AI, even though it was made by humans. Right. So if you get an autonomous vehicle, it's always going to make the right choice. We mm. know that for sure because no mistakes can happen. No. It'll never become AI. crippled by a cone. <laughs> uh, Jeff, I found this to be the least surprising news ever. The least surprising? I don't know. First thing I thought is like this has got to be a movie. Yeah. I mean, who do you tab to, to put in this? I was thinking, you know, Chris Hemsworth or maybe Mark Wahlberg or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so clearly someone without <laughs> sleeves on. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody who's comfortable running and sweating a lot, yeah. Um, the one thing I would say whenever I see these types of stories is I kind of go the other way. Like, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater type of thing. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of positive technology involved with the use of drones in environments similar to this. Now, we don't want it turning on us, obviously. Uh, this is not what we want. But 
Um, kind of going back to the the last story, mm-hmm. we are learning. Um, mm-hmm. We'll, we'll yeah. learn from this, so hopefully it doesn't happen again. But when we look at the use of drones in military applications, it keeps a lot of a lot of soldiers out of harm's way too. So there is positive applications, and we don't want to just abandon the technology or the use of artificial intelligence in these types of yeah applications. Well, I mean, that one guy was in harm's way. But we don't know who he was or why he was <laughs> no targeted. Casu- no or... casualties reported. No, um, it doesn't say that. It says that that they didn't or know. Confirmed. Yeah, confirmed. Yeah, no so or it was not. Yeah, yeah. So we don't know. Uh, so these weapons that you're talking about, Jeff, or drones, are known as lethal autonomous weapon systems or laws. And this specific quadcopter was a Cargo 2, an attack drone that's made by a Turkish company, STM, that can be operated both autonomously and manually. And it's important to note that the report did not say if it was being operated autonomously. Uh, It uses machine learning and real-time image processing to uh, attack the targets. And it's a one of the first true fire, forget, and find weapons, which is, I found interesting because it's a weapon that can be fired once and then guide itself to a target without reestablishing a connection to the operator before attacking. So you basically set it and forget it with these uh, laws. Which is weird though, right? That we're doing this? Yes. I don't know. Equally weird, equally weird is the campaign to stop killer robots, hell of a name, recently put out a survey and they oh, they found that only 62% of people, I'm gonna stress the only 62% of people, are opposed to using lethal autonomous weapon systems. That seems low to me. Well, nobody thinks they're coming after you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they're going after the bad guys. Well, and to Jeff's point, people are probably thinking like in military applications, if this is not a person who has to take this tremendous risk and it's a, Mm -hmm. but I think in our minds, we wanna think that the technology is a little bit more foolproof than it clearly is. The, uh, the next big problem that I read, uh, there's a study from Cornell, could be social robots that uh, operate autonomously because industrial robots, you know, work in cages. So there's a layer of safety around those where social robots have direct contact with humans and will be operating autonomously. I mean, it's very likely that in the event that we make it to old age, we're going to be cared for by a robot. Oh, and they're going to take us down these uncomfortable rabbit hole conversations and you're not gonna be able to get out of that conversation no there's nobody in the control room that you can be like enough yeah. i don't want to talk about whatever I, yeah I, stop solving the crossword for me yeah i'm doing this for stop myself stop trying to enroll me in your multi-level marketing program right i don't want to sell <laughs> i'll take the yeah. chair up the stairs you don't need to carry me every time uh but i mean Jeff, I feel like this is something that will play a larger role in our lives. Uh, yeah, but again, I go back to it's not the, the tool, it's how you use it. Yeah, and, and that's what it all comes back to, in my opinion. You can't just say this is garbage tech and we don't want it. Oh, no, that's um, not what I'm saying. <clears throat> so even, and even in those applications where you're talking about social applications and, and being more interactive with people, I see a lot of positives from that. I see oh, yeah. a lot of burden reduced on families trying to care for ailing family members. Mm-hmm. That is very difficult. And if this helps solve some of these problems in terms of cost as well, I mean, healthcare workers, that's that's a difficult thing to find right now. So mm-hmm. if we can, again, we're going to have missteps, and I'm not trying to make this <laughs> as a small misstep here. I don't think we want robots hunting people. Um, but I think it's a it's a big leap to just be like, yeah, this is scary and this is this is the bad route to take. I disagree with that. No, I don't think it's a bad route to take. I do think that, you know, A, we should make sure they don't kill people accidentally. The wrong people. I'm just going to say people in general and leave it at that. <laughs> because then next the robot is going to be in charge of who is the right one and the wrong one. No, that's where you don't. That's where you stop. Yeah, that's. That's the problem. But that's they the don't AI. Stop. Yeah, they don't. That's stop. the AI going like, "Thank you for your feedback. That one's not good. I've I've chosen. I've yeah, we know. For you. We know facial recognition does not work. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Let's move on. Let's to move on. A sunnier, sunnier time. Let's go on to in case you missed it. Uh, the stories this week that weren't as popular but still stand to make a big impact on the uh, on the industry. Uh, let's start with Jeff's. What do you got for us this week? So I thought it was interesting. Uh, we ran a story about Bill Gates um, basically building a new type of nuclear reactor in place of an old coal plant. And I like this story because it's, again, it's one of those where we're talking about 
not just doing something clean or green just because it's clean and green. It's because it makes a ton of sense. Okay. So basically they're taking a coal plant um, that was retired um, and they're turning it into a, a plant that features a sodium reactor and molten salt energy storage system. Yeah. So basically it's cleaner than coal. Mm -hmm. And it's more efficient than a traditional nuclear power plant. And it's yeah. safer as well because you're looking at sodium-based power as opposed to really super toxic stuff. Mm -hmm. The other thing is it's going to be running on stuff that they mine right there in Wyoming where this plant is. Mm -hmm. So you've got, we've talked a lot about people like Gates and like Musk and Jeff Bezos who are trying to get us to Mars as opposed to solving problems here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And here you've got a guy who's got the resources, got the technological understanding of what to do. And he's working with people to actually put forward what I feel is a really viable solution. And if he can provide scale here and go from there, um, I think this is awesome. I think because we all want, regardless of your feelings on environment and all of that, climate change, we all want a power source that's cleaner, mm -hmm. cheaper, safer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just no, I don't think you can argue that. <laughs> yeah, and I just never knew that that source was hot salt. There you go. Hot salt. It is. Well, that's basically it's a what hot it is. salt plant. Yeah. Like, uh, I was, no, when you selected the story, I was really interested because when I was reading it, I mean, I was trying to, I mean, there are obviously many different ways the plant works, but it all comes down to. But it's even hot taking, salt. it's even taking like rare metals or the, mm -hmm. the bad metals out of like water wells. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it just checks a ton mm -hmm. of boxes and it's putting all that technology that we have access to into a good place and a very practical application. That, and I think you said it a couple of weeks ago, Anna, when we talk about some of this stuff, it's not super sexy. It, it doesn't make a ton of headlines, but man, it should. Mm -hmm. Because it, it just, I don't know, it makes too much sense to me. So do you think that the answer is to take more of a sort of methodical piecemeal approach to like selecting specific emission reduction targets, like instead of a broad brush um, applying to any industrial facility. So like, for example, we we covered um, this week that Exxon, like the top three polluting plants in the US right. are all three Exxon plants. Yeah, refineries, yeah. Yeah, so um, Exxon sells like mitigation equipment mm -hmm. <laughs> that a lot of other plants use and, and yet they're still putting out all these s small particulates. Um, taking these, if we can find out who they are, which clearly we can, taking these plants one by one and providing some sort of incentive for them to modernize and, you know, upgrade yeah. to like, is that the solution? I think it is. It's when you show them something that this isn't going to shut you down. Mm -hmm. This isn't a disciplinary action. We're not going to, we're going to show you something that's just simply better mm -hmm. and we're going to help you put it in place. It's not going to cost you a ton of money. And guess what? Like in this case, it's safer. Yeah. I mean, what industrial facility right now wouldn't take something that's, less expensive, easy to implement, and is going to keep you out of the newspapers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. All, all carrot, yeah. minimal stick. But right. we hear a lot, this is how we've always done things. Yeah, but that's also because there's a, a sometimes it's accurate and sometimes it's a misunderstanding of, I'm going to have to shut everything down. Do you mm -hmm. know what downtime costs me? Yeah. Downtime is a huge killer for, it doesn't matter what you're making. Mm -hmm. So they don't want to do that. I've got 10 other things that I can need to invest in, including hiring more people. What do you want me to do, David? Do you want me to clean up these emissions or do you want me to be able to hire 10 more people this year? You know, clean it it's up. those types of like conversations that. That, that take place that are hard. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you're anti-environment because you don't want to make those investments it's because you're looking at a different type of big picture. Yeah. So that's why, you know, when we look at opportunities like this and if this can work and it's scalable, these are the types of things I think we should be talking about more. I was also interested to see that Bill Gates was out in front of this one too. He was the he was the guy on film. He's moving past his recent. Did, is he moving past it, or drama. was it just recorded beforehand? And they're know. like, "Oh, we got to do. We got to roll it." If I mean, we we are using Bill well, on this one. If yeah. it's not Bill, mm -hmm. how does this even get to be a story? Right. It's not Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it's just a guy out there who's the smartest salt engineer in the planet. Yeah. And he's saying, "I got it. I figured it out." We aren't going to pay attention. We yeah. talked last week about um, what was a real, what appeared to be a very sound engineering premise for uh, supersonic airplanes. And guess what? They didn't have the capital. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the money. And they had some big people behind them. Yeah. So this guy's got 
It's you're got saying, a little capital. You're saying that this is not your, in case you missed it this week, if it, the headline is hot salt reactor at coal plants. I'm saying it should be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm saying, I don't know if the AP even covers this if yeah. Bill Gates isn't attached to it. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good call. I'm they just, maybe cover it, though, if you call it hot salt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't mean, know, think about it. Who's on the hot salt beat at the AP? Yeah. Wow. Mm hmm. Call Koenig. Anna. <laughs> What was your, that was just the random AP writer I thought of, David Koenig. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your, in case you missed it this week? So workers at a Smithfield plant in Iowa are considering a strike after talks between the company and the union have broken down. Mm-hmm. Um, we heard a lot about the Smithfield plant this year. They are threatening to walk out over issues relating to wages, health care, breaks, basically everything. And the union said workers have risked their health and lives throughout the pandemic, arguing the company should do more for its employees. And there was a huge COVID outbreak at this plant. Mm -hmm. Um, It made a lot of news uh, because it was right kind of at that tipping point when meat workers were declared essential workers. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of people who worked at this plant like were interviewed by media sources and it really did not reflect well on the company at the time people saying they were worried about their jobs and they felt like they couldn't stay home even though there was just rampant COVID in the plant but um anyway it the story i thought was interesting because it made me wonder if the manufacturing workforce some of them between like pandemic fatigue and how these frontline workers really felt that their lives were put at risk or they were overworked or overwhelmed during the pandemic they now have a lot of leverage because Mm -hmm. of this worker shortage that is causing a lot especially like meat packers um, a lot of these companies to really have to slow down or raise their wages or do something to get these people to either work for them or stay there i just wonder if we're going to see a more aggressive stance from unions and maybe their members this year as people draw a line and say no this is what we want um, and kind of put some pressure on these companies to comply in order to keep their workforce intact. Did you mention what was the tipping point that they're on the verge of strike now? Because I feel like, I mean, maybe the company is going to call their bluff if they asked him to go to work during a global pandemic. And they're mm-hmm. like, sure, as long as I have a mask. Yeah, I don't know. They're, it said that they're um, threatening like work stoppages. Okay. And this was yesterday Okay. that we, um, that this story was filed. So I don't I haven't seen any progress today on this. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes these talks can drag on forever before, uh, you know, a group would actually strike. But right. who knows? I mean, like I said before, they they do have more leverage now. That is clear. I mean, you can't walk down the street without somebody talking about a worker shortage and whatever you believe the cause of that is mm-hmm. or if you feel like that's being inflated. Um, I don't know. But uh, it's a real issue and you know plants are dealing with it and especially kind of these lower wage workers who feel like well you know what <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'll go work somewhere else because i can't you yeah know? yeah i can make the same somewhere else mm-hmm. jeff do you foresee more workers flexing that sort of muscle that they have right now because of those shortages do you see that having any impact I think it does depend on the industry here. This one will be interesting to see how it plays out because we're not talking, I mean, it's Sioux Falls, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So it's not a huge area. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the, you know, the employment Mm -hmm. type of stats look like in that area, but these folks are making 18 bucks an hour right now, which isn't, which isn't bottom of the scale by any, any stretch. Mm -hmm. And really they're only asking for a dollar more. So you would think Smithfield right now would, it would behoove them to, to meet these guys somewhere along the lines, especially because we're coming up on the summer months. People are grilling out, consuming a little bit more of this type of thing. Well, there's been, the industry has been hit by yeah. repeated uh, impacts to the supply chain. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. So I do agree. I think the I think the union does have a lot of leverage here. I think the timing is right for them. And the things they're asking for do not appear to be like ridiculous. Okay? Yeah. I mean, these Breaks. seem very reasonable. Uh, plus, if you've ever, you know, we have foodmanufacturing.com. Um, I've done some food manufacturing stories. I've been to these facilities. It's hard work. Mm-hmm. It is. It is very difficult work. And these guys, they earn every penny of it. Mm-hmm. So um, you would think in this case they do. And there are other situations where I think the union's got to be careful. If you're if you're an auto worker right now, you need to be careful. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we look at a lot of e-commerce and fulfillment locations right now. There's a lot of technology coming into those types of environments where workers need to understand 
how far they can flex on some of this. Mm -hmm. So I think it will depend on the industry here. Yeah, I think they got some clout. So it was a it was a dollar in breaks. It, it wasn't. I didn't see specific beyond. They said the issues were relating to wages, healthcare, and breaks. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that's an easier middle ground to find. It's, and, and, well, the one thing, I just, maybe it's just the starting wage. The oh, starting okay. wage right now is 18. The union wants to make it 19. Mm -hmm. So Okay. Okay. I feel like we're not too far apart on that one. Okay. All right. Uh, my in case you missed it this week, Jeff, we're talking about supersonic jets again because last week we talked about the demise of Ariane Supersonic, which is the Boeing back company that wanted to make sonic boomless supersonic planes. The company had $11 billion in sales backlog, but they still ran out of money. And I was bummed because I want to fly on a supersonic jet. Then on Thursday, United Airlines announced plans to buy 15 jets from the startup Boom Supersonic with an option for 35 more. The deal is worth $3 billion, about $200 million per plane, but a prototype hasn't flown yet. However, United hopes to start carrying passengers on these planes by 2029. That is exciting. So from New York to London in three and a half hours, I'm not gonna take it, but hey, that's fast. San Francisco to Tokyo in only six, still not gonna do it. Could make a comment about a vacation to which I'll go home and Carrie will be like, we never take them, still be fine. But <laughs> supersonic, alive and well, and Let's just say instead of cutting down New York to London, maybe we just cut down, I don't know, Madison to Vegas. I'll be happy if we start there. I don't know, though. Eight years? Hmm? That's a long time to wait. Man, it's going to go fast. Well, are they going to run out of capital? We've kind of covered that story before. I mean, this is, is Boom going to make it? They're going to make it. They have $3 billion now. And I mean, even though great... Ariane had eleven. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a great name. Yeah. Got to give them that. Boom. Who doesn't want to fly Boom. Well, yeah, and also like, oh, sorry, I, I, sorry I, it's a three billion dollar deal, yeah. but like, not did, until there's a plan to buy. Yeah, like I don't know if this really <laughs> tells us a supersonic is alive and well. It, it feels like to me a feel good story for United mm -hmm. um, because it gets people excited. You know, airline travel people are still maybe a little mixed about. It kind of like injects some life back into that. Um, but for Boom, I mean. They have not, they're a, a younger company, first of all, than Arian was. Mm -hmm. They have not raised the nearly the amount of capital as Arian did. And Arian said that their project was like a $4 billion project. This mm -hmm. company is, has raised like $300 million in capital. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I feel like I'm with Jeff. A lot has to happen between now and the end of the decade before I'll be like, this Sorry, is going to happen. Oh, they got I, it. Yeah. They got it. United Airlines said it. And I stand by the airlines because an airline has never lied to me or done me wrong. <laughs> David still has a Zoom. Yeah. yeah. He's, a, he's an early adapter. As long as you keep charging it, it still works. There you go. <laughs> no, uh, actually, that's interesting. So Boom is younger than Arion. Do you think they called it Boom Supersonic because Arion was boomless? Uh, maybe, maybe. Maybe, yeah. maybe it was a jab. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're bringing the boom back. Yeah. Well, both of you are wrong. The prototype, while it's not flown yet, probably right around the corner. It's <laughs> right, exactly. I'm, I'm sure that a third scale model has looked great in wind tunnel testing. Oh, yeah. yeah, and then United, who's had a terrible year, will pay for it in airport food vouchers. Oh. <laughs> 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 it's coming, David. Yeah. I have just a drawer of those downstairs <laughs> from every terrible thing that's happened on a flight. You know what? Have a meal voucher. It's 2 a.m. Where am I going to put this? Oh, it expires in 12 hours. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe not for breakfast. Plus, and they're always for like seven bucks. Mm -hmm. And what you need is like 11. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can buy yourself a cookie and a water, sir. There you go. Which is what I would buy. Yeah, anyway. that's what I would. <laughs> uh, I remain optimistic, um, but I thought it was still cool. Do you know, do either of you know, so when you have something like this, is it just a handshake deal where like United says, you know what? If you get it, mm -hmm. we'll buy 15. How about we put out a press release? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder if there's any sort of uh, uh, skin in the game for them there. That's what I'm wondering too. I mean, you would think so, but it didn't really say so. Mm -hmm. well, well, I think United is also, they can get a pretty good headline here that isn't about layoffs. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, it's more than that. It's the future. It's All the right. future of air travel. That's cute, David. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know my final thought's going to be more grim now. But no, uh, Jeff, do you have any final thoughts this week? 
Um, I just want to um, publicly congratulate my oldest daughter. She's graduating from high school. Um, oh, that's awesome. This weekend. So, Vanya, I love you, and I'm very proud of you. Does she listen to the podcast? She will now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, She'll just fast forward to the end. Yeah. I'm assuming this year has been tough for her. You know, everything. It's been weird. It's been really weird. Um, You know, especially like around here, the smaller high schools, they've been in person. They were able to do it. And um, she's been virtual for since March. So Mm -hmm. all three of the kids have done well with it, though. Of the people that I feel for that sort of have that lost year, seniors in high school, Mm -hmm. that is just such has such an impact on a person. What a bummer. Yeah. And that sucks. Well, she at least she will get to walk across the stage. They are having an outdoor ceremony and stuff. So, um yeah, good stuff. That's, that's good. Great. And yeah, now you're going to get like a hooded sweatshirt of the college that she goes to? Well, we've got her party coming up, and we all ordered T-shirts to the University of wisconsin Stevens Point. Nice. So, good. Go Pointers. There you go. What yeah. is a pointer? It is a dog. Oh, fun fact. Our head of our multimedia department is also a former pointer. Mm, so it doesn't always work out for people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Just tell her to hit the books hard, yeah. Um. <laughs> or there's always video editing as a fallback. Yeah. Um, Way fallback. <laughs> <laughs> you just fall off. Anna, what is your final thought this week? Okay, so I had a kind of a milestone birthday this week. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Well, happy birthday. Thanks. But um, I'm going out to dinner this weekend at a restaurant for the first time in like, I don't know, last year. Yeah. And I am so excited. <laughs> well, so I was... Again, happy birthday. That's awesome. I'm glad that you get a chance to actually celebrate. I but, know. So talking about shortages, I heard they're opening up all the restaurants and they have no one to staff No one them. is working there? Yeah. So Maybe we'll have to, to make our own food. I don't know. They didn't say that, but. I mean, even still, that would probably be exciting. Yeah, like, I don't care. Yeah. I, like, I'll do that. I'll wait on my own table. That's so fine. So what's the birthday meal? What do you go? Do you go like, is it Mexican food? It's, well, no, this is embarrassing. It's like, like new american fancy outdoor patio but i don't care what Who the food cares? is yeah i yeah, don't care yeah. like i don't even care what the food is i just I'm sit there and let the fact this... that somebody else made it and brings it to you is i know and i don't have huge. to do the dishes i yeah. don't think <laughs> <laughs> possibly no that's very cool uh happy birthday um my final thought this week is that uh after my son has run into yet another pole uh while playing on a playground I assure everyone I, n- I don't beat my children. No. <laughs> you got to make that public. Uh, I, oh. I, have, I have little kids also, and I n- know, like, what y- you mean. Because like, yeah, they just, like, fly into stuff like crazy, and then you're like, no. The, ah. the daredevil you mentality. See it coming. I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you can see it coming, the daredevil, like, they get that flare in their eyes. And you're just mm-hmm. like, he's going to go for it. I'm so far away. Um, but yeah, jumped off the back of a slide he decided not to go into, Aww. into a pole, Ugh. and it somehow made this interesting bruise that still split him open and somehow makes it look like sandpaper went across his face. And it's just every week after a weekend, it's, and you know, it's on his grandmother, but we love her. Um, you know, you take him a to daycare. A lot of disclaimers in this closing yeah. thought. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the teachers are always just... What happened this time? Like, I'm sorry, it happened on my time. But anyway. You know, um, our pediatrician always, when she sees, like, the kids, like, scuffed up summer legs, she's like, this is what three-year-olds' legs should look like. She's like, it shows me that they're getting outside and getting crazy and having fun, you know? Yes. So I guess think of it that way. I mean, that's what I try to, because that stuff happens and you can't, like. <laughs> yeah, no, so I'm, I want to change my final thoughts of that. Yeah, just get outside, get crazy, and have fun. <laughs> All right. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and share the podcast. And to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, Anna, or David at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. Make sure you get it in the email. Make sure you get it in your inbox first. Uh, For Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti. This has been the Today in Manufacturing podcast. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.